Hi, this is Patrick Lussier, director of My Bloody Valentine 3D, and this is The Graveyard Show. Welcome to The Graveyard. You are listening to the Graveyard Show podcast, the Tombstone Edition. I am your caretaker, and the graveyard is open. Thank you for joining me here on this very first Tombstone Edition of the Graveyard Show podcast. The point of these Tombstone Editions is to highlight previous interviews that I did on the Graveyard Show podcast back in the years 2009 and 2010. I included a link to the short six-minute video I created not too long ago, just giving a simple introduction to the show, who I am, and what you can expect to hear in the upcoming weeks and months to come here on my YouTube channel. So hop on over there and take a listen when you can. As you heard at the top of the show, director Patrick Lussier will be joining me to discuss his film My Bloody Valentine 3D, which was being released at that time. But before I get to that, I wanted to mention something. With some of my earlier interviews I conducted on the Graveyard Show podcast, I didn't have the professional equipment I needed to record the interviews the way I originally intended. So what you're essentially hearing will be a recorded phone call. Eventually, I was able to correct that, so with the later interviews I conducted, you'll be hearing me inside the graveyard and my guests on the phone. I am happy to say that I was able to slightly remaster this interview, so there's less hiss on the line and the audio levels are a lot more even. So without any further delay, just follow my werewolf over there. He will take you deep inside the graveyard archives where you will need to go, but don't worry, when the time is right, he will lead you right back here safe and sound. So let's revisit my interview with director Patrick Lussier. The time, February 2nd, 2009, the place. Graveyard Show podcast number nine. I will see you right back here when you return. Safe travels. I thought it would be appropriate to have the director of My Bloody Valentine on, this being, of course, Valentine's Day week. I'll be talking to Patrick about uh, uh, his thoughts about the uh, film's release. Um, Will there be a sequel coming out? And if so, will it be in 2D or will it be in 3D? And uh, we'll be talking about uh, the making of the film, among other things. I can't believe we're already midway through February. Uh, Granted, it is the shortest month of the year, but it just never ceases to amaze me how quickly time goes by. You know, one minute we're celebrating New Year's, and now here we are already approaching Valentine's Day, and of course tomorrow being Friday the 13th. Um, It just amazes me. I'm already seven weeks into my brand new podcast nine episodes in and uh it feels like i just started now granted seven weeks isn't exactly a long time but um it just blows my mind that i'm already two months in and as you can hear in the background another grave is being prepared and that would be for my next guest he is the director of my bloody valentine 3d and dracula 2000 and he has been west craven's film editor for the last 20 years. He's done the Scream series as well as Cursed, among other films. His name is Patrick Lussier, and he is my guest in the graveyard. So, Patrick, first of all, I'd just like to thank you for joining me in the graveyard. Oh, absolutely. I also want to congratulate you on the uh, job well done remaking My Bloody Valentine. I think it's one of the few times where a remake actually uh, is, is a whole lot better than the original. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, that's... Uh, uh, I'm sure there are many who uh, will always hold the original in the highest of esteem, but it was great to uh, be able to do something I was faithful and then could uh, use all the modern technology to uh, tell, a, tell a, I guess, a story that's more modern. Your movie was the first feature this year to come out in 3D that was in a wide release. So that's always being, it's always fun being the first one, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, uh, that kind of happened initially by accident. It was something that we realized we wanted to make, when the studio wanted to make the movie 3D, and then we, then it just kind of like, oh, I think we can come out ahead of everybody else. 
Uh, final destination was Final Destination 4 in 3D was shooting. They started shooting ahead of us, but we knew their effects were extensive um, and ours were not. Uh, so that uh, we had every opportunity uh, to uh, beat them to the punch. Well, as of this taping, your, your film's made about $45 million uh, U.S., and I know that it set a box office record in the U.K. when it opened. Yeah. Um, was, it, uh, was it a little disappointing, though, that it didn't open at number one? Because I'll be honest, I thought it was a no-brainer that the film was going to open up number one hands down. You know, here's the thing. It wasn't disappointing at all because, because uh, the, three, the, the ratio of the film's profits is 6 to 1 for 3D yep. screens to non-3D screens. There's only 1,033 uh, 3D screens at the time we opened the film. Uh, okay. Uh, so considering that we made 21... Uh, plus million dollars for the three day, 24 for the four day, on uh, on just uh, over a thousand and thirty three screens is is uh, actually pretty incredible. Yeah, and also the fact that you know you're still here, you are you're still in the top ten, and Underworld was released last week, yeah, and that has dropped I think down to seven, so in its second week. So I have to say, I mean, it really says a lot about your film. Yeah, well, I mean, the whole point in, in making the film was to make something that was it was fun and reminiscent of the, of uh, of those films of the '80s. I mean, I I grew up in that period of time and and uh, started being able to see R-rated movies at that time, and so I remember them all very well because those are all the films we uh, all went to see. Um, so when we set out to make it, we wanted to make something that wasn't like you know uh, the hostels and the and just put some women in a room and torch them to pieces and watch them be dismembered slowly. Um, that wasn't anything we wanted to do. We wanted to make something that captured that real kind of Friday night movie vibe. And uh, and I think people have really connected to that. Well, now, of course, I have to ask the obvious. Um, has there been any discussion about doing a sequel? Uh, there has. You know, we... Um, we discussed... Uh, we, we actually pitched a sequel... Uh, to, to uh, Lionsgate last December, Todd and I kind of came up with something and said, hey, you know, if there was to be continuing adventures, this is how the continuing adventures could go. Um, right now, the studio is just uh, weighing whether or not they want to pursue that uh, and how they want to pursue it, if, uh, if that's how they want to do it, if they can make it all scheduled for this year, if they were to move, move ahead, because you've, you know, you've got certain cast members of TV shows and things like that, which uh, puts you into a very specific shooting window and mm -hmm. whether or not they could be ready for that. So, Now, has there been discussion if a sequel is done, would it be done? In th has there been that discussion? Or uh, oh, yeah, I, uh, absolutely. And in, okay. in my opinion, if we were to do it, yeah, the whole point would be to do it in 3D. So, okay. uh, you know, we'll see, we'll see what that is uh, and how that'll work and, and, and whether or not uh, it all lines up uh, for us to do or not. Now, you're Canadian, and yes. My Bloody Valentine is a Canadian horror film. Uh -huh. So that must have been a pretty big opportunity to be able to make, as a Canadian, being able to make a remake of a Canadian horror film as a classic. Well, yeah, it was. I mean, there were so many uh, of those Canadian tax shelter slasher movies that were done around that period of time. Um, even going back as far, you know, but, uh, not, you know, six, seven years before that with Black Christmas. Yep. Um, but then, you know, there was the, the producers of this who produced, uh, you know, Happy Birthday to Me and stuff like that, and, and, and a bunch of these other kind of little tax shelter movies. Uh, and then there's, you know, like Prom Night and, and Terror Train and all those other films, which, uh, which just took advantage of the, of the Canadian, Canadian culture laws at the time, yep. which, which seemed to be a very, loo <laughs> very loose yeah. uh, definition of culture. Uh, uh, which you could get the money, and that it was great that it could spawn that. So you know, it was pretty exciting. Now I read that I, I read that initially you had hesitations uh, to do the film. I didn't have a hesitation to do the film. It was, I, it was when it was initially mentioned to me. It was you know I was in the middle of of kind of the the uh, whatever the job was on uh, on the eye um, and. The studio had said, you know, we're just getting the rights to remake my Bloody Valentine. You're interested? And it was just like, well, yeah, okay. Um, and it was just kind of like my Bloody Valentine. And I'm like, which one was that? Um, and then went back and found the film and rewatched it and, and um, kind of got why you do it. And then it was all just about, you know, what, what the script was going to be like. Now, um, can you talk about the fine line of trying to keep the spirit of the original, but also at the same time trying to make something that's yours? And Yeah, that's I mean, uh, you know, we... 
we very much wanted to, you know, Todd Farmer, especially myself, we went we went back to uh, the original film and talked to Mike Pastor at Lionsgate about it and John Sackey, and we went we went through and we looked at what people really liked in the original film, what they took away from that original film, you know, the 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 iconic killer, yeah, this great uh, killer in the minor, um, the love triangle, you know, the uh, a heart in a box. Um, uh, uh, certain sequences, you know, sm- uh, the, the miners smashing uh, the lights in the mine, the, the mine setting, the industrial setting, the fact that it's about young, you know, kind of adults and not about teenagers. That was a huge thing that I, I felt was uh, important to retain. And then it was just uh, looking at it and, and, and adapting that into a, a story that, you know, the prodigal stun story and really exploiting that in a, in a fuller uh, in, a, in a more more kind of robust way than they did in the original. Um, in the original, it, it has a it has a certain uh, almost uh, campy quality with the hey, there's going to be a party in the mine and stuff like that. We actually play yeah. all that. You know, we our opening is yep. kind of a direct homage to, to yeah. that tone of the original film. You know, the first 13 minutes, and then we once we do that, then we get on with the story. Well, those are two of the things that uh, that I noticed was. Uh, in your version, your film just, I mean, it's stark. It, it, it kicks it into high gear right off the bat, and I think that helps pull the audiences into your film. I know yeah, just- I mean, that, that's a trick that I had learned, uh, you know, for years of working for, with Wes Craven, um, mm-hmm. you know, as his editor, and, and, and we worked together, I guess, for almost 20 years now. Um, wow. Wow. Actually talking to you from his cutting room. Uh, um, um But uh, it's... Uh, it was the idea that you know you want to start by showing the audience that you're insane, um, that you'll do things that they won't expect, that mm-hmm. you will, uh, you know, basically take no prisoners uh, and get them enough, far enough of balance that then you can then buy the next 20 minutes of character development um, yeah. to tell the story. So that it was a very deliberate ploy to to do that in terms of the storytelling to. You know, we wanted to show the aftermath of, this, of the of the hospital massacre to be yep. incredibly extreme. Uh, yep. uh, when we were shooting that, uh, Gary Tunnicliffe, our makeup effects guy, uh, had like you know, bu- literally buckets of blood, and we're running, and cups of blood was running down the hallways of this real hospital, just throwing oh. it everywhere. And it's like Gary, because it's 3D, we see all the way down there. We need to see blood here, blood here, blood here. Yep. We need blood everywhere. And then he was grabbing like roses and throwing rose petals everywhere. It was. Oh. Oh it, it was it was like he was uh, you know the decorator of the damned, um, <laughs> but it was uh, we felt that you know, we wanted to show people what they were in for immediately. That's the thing. That's what I took out of it was that I was like, oh wow, especially when um, early in the film when when uh, the, during the party and the uh, the uh, pitchfork or the uh, I'm sorry the pickaxe goes through the kid's eye. <laughs> it's like where did this come, where did this come from? And I mean, it really, uh, it was so enjoyable, and uh, it really just, uh, like, yeah, it just well, it, it, right in. That was a, you know, the the pickaxe the eye was a was kind of an exercise in 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 kind of different misdirection because you you set up you know woman alone in a creepy place where exactly where she shouldn't be, and and uh, then the you know the kid jumps out and there's kind of the sting is a little half-hearted and the music yep. and everything like that, and you're kind of like oh oh. That's you know I, that's a swing. I'm pretty sure that's a miss. And yeah. so that you kind of suddenly the audience is diffused, and then wham, you hit them with this full-blown shocking. I can't believe I'm seeing it. Violent yeah. act. That suddenly you you disarm them and then whack them in the head uh, as hard as possible. <laughs> well, uh, it worked. Yeah, it was it was great. It, it worked when we shot it. Uh, it was the type of thing that when we did it on set, it was it it literally pushed you back and you're like holy crap yeah. that's gonna work <laughs> um and uh you know jamie was there when she she, she was standing right next to me when we, when we shot the shot of uh, of uh uh michael who plays uh jason in that, that mm-hmm. moment the kid who gets hit in the back of the head and, and was just wow that is totally gonna rock people off their seats and that's gonna feel good too when you're on the set knowing that it's gonna translate from the set onto the big screen yeah, it's it's very satisfying. You know, we had a great crew, and 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 uh, you know the, the the DP Brian Pearson and I had worked together several times. Gary Tunnicliffe and I worked together tons, and and uh, having that those collaborators and, and knowing that uh, 
each thing that we were creating was going to be so effective and that we'd you know, been able to hone our craft of misdirection and frontal assault um, to a point where we were, where we were confident you know, that we were going to be able to uh, keep people engaged in the roller coaster. Now, the horror genre seems to be the one where 3D movies are made the most. What do you think it is about the horror genre that uh, works for that for this particular style of filmmaking? You know, it's um, 3D is slightly more expensive, although we didn't allow any extra money for it. Um, you know, we paid extra money for it, but we absorbed it from the rest of the budget that it would have cost to actually make the film. The horror movies, by and large, don't rely on having huge name cast, uh, which means that you can you can sink more money into the technology. Um, it becomes, I think, a, a safer way to experiment with something new as opposed to, oh my god, we've just paid $20 million on an actor, what if we don't like how this turns out and we've made this commitment to this technology? Um, so in that, it's kind of like, I think, you know, throughout cinematic history, the horror films have kind of been a way to kind of break new ground for that very reason, because they, they, they are, are, usually have less of an outlay and therefore therefore they're allowed to be riskier in in both in in story and content and execution and everything as a director how do you go about preparing to shoot in the 3d film where where exactly do you begin your planning uh well you go to 3d school and then uh you shoot 3d you know we shot at one 3d test and it was incredibly informative and then we when we location scouted everything we did was about depth and and, and claustrophobic depth Mm -hmm. um, you know, you don't want to shoot like a western or a movie out in the middle of the ocean mm -hmm. in 3D because you don't have any depth cues because there, you know there's nothing behind people to because it's all about you know cues of depth. The mine was the perfect location because it's uh, for a 3D film because you had all these incredible rich texture um, depth that went on yet it was claustrophobic and surrounding and and you could really envelop the audience into that space. You know, so we found the same in the grocery store in. in uh, Ben Foley's house, the, the Kevin Ty's character's house, you know, having that long hallway, things like that. You know, we looked for all those things. Um, shot uh, almost the entire film except for four days. Uh, almost, so uh, everything else was shot on real locations in the real world, which adds to the reality of putting the audience into the environment of the picture. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it is interesting because I did, I did pick that up in the minds how the 3D does work so well and does make you feel claustrophobic, especially when Tom is in, he's in the, um, he's in the, in the cage. Yeah. Uh, and, and I mean, a lot of that. And when, um, is it, uh, Betsy was behind, you know, the bed yeah. uh, the bed behind you know, the frame and all, I mean, it was, they're, they're, you really did make such great use of that. Um, was there any concern that the movie wouldn't translate though, when it went to a t uh, 2D format? No, because we were we were cutting the movie in 2D, so we knew it worked in 2D. Um, okay. uh, we were very uh, confident that it would work in that regard. The first time we showed to uh, to the studio, they saw it in 2D, and they were amazed at how well it worked flat, because uh, they were thinking, you know, it was only going to be a, a 3D experience. But it's like the story hooked them in, and you could feel uh, just as engaged. Um, uh, Obviously, the 3D has a has a very enveloping experience. Uh, you know, the other thing that I want to mention too is that I think your film has um, used the opening title sequence uh, in a 3D format, the best that I've seen so far. I mean, with the news articles and and the credits over the newspapers and sort of transitions. I mean, that was that was really fabulous. Yeah, you know, that was something that uh, Partners in Crime uh, created for us. Uh, they had never done a 3D sequence before. You know, they did the, the credits for like the Bourne movies and, and, uh -huh. and stuff for Twilight and stuff like that. So for it was a lot of back and forth in, in making the 3D work. Um, uh, one of the things you, have, you find when you have multiple layers like that in, in 3D is that you're trying to make sure that um, all, all the depth of every layer is correct so that you don't have something in the middle trying to, trying to come out against something in the foreground and things like that. It's incredibly complicated uh, when you're dealing with multiple planes in that environment, but it was, uh, it was really effective. And, and uh, Pastor, Mike Pasternak really pushed for us to, uh, to in include that uh, sequence into, into, and to create that. It was great to, to see it all come to life in such glorious three dimensions. Now, for you being on set, can you describe what the physical process of shooting the film is like? Because, I mean, most people, even people that work in production, 
most people haven't worked in a 3D format. So what, what was it like on uh, when for you on set with the staging and the setup? Um, you know, the, the biggest thing is you've got to be a little more conscientious about framing. Um, you want to make sure that, you know, both eyes are seeing are seeing the image and that you don't have something so much on the edge that, you know, your right eye is seeing it and your left eye is not. Mm -hmm. um, little things like that. Um, things are better included, you know, in the shot. You want to know where you're have a sense of where you're going to cut, and especially if you've pulled things way off the screen, uh, you want to know where you're going to go to next. The hand at the beginning, uh, you know, when the hand is hanging over the desk. Yep. Um, you know, we when we were shooting that, because we knew we were going to pull that 3D of that way off the screen, we had to know where we were going to next. You know, what is the next thing it's going to go to? Um, uh, the dissolve that, that that happens with that shot was planned on uh, was planned right from the shooting that we had to dissolve to something else afterwards because we were we were pulling so extreme into the audience. Um, so so you didn't like suddenly jar the audience back because it wasn't designed to be that kind of moment. So um, you know things like that you you have to have a lot of planning. You you plan your 3D crescendos. You know, it's not every moment of, uh, oh, uh, he throws his coffee, you know, his, his coffee cup out and he goes right to the lens and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. You, know, you have to be a little bit careful about what you do in the lens because uh, you don't want to break the beam splitter, you don't want to break the camera. So, you know, we occasionally get notes from the studio, how come more things aren't thrown at the camera? It's just kind of like because we'd break it and then we'd stop shooting. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and <laughs> people were like, you know, how come you didn't have the mop flying right into the camera? It's because we had an actor swinging the mop, and the last thing you want to do is hit the side of the camera and be shut down for the rest of the day. Exactly. It's it's all about illusion, not about reality. Yeah. Yeah. Well, exactly. And so you ha you have to you always have to weigh one side against the other, you know, and uh, and that's why so many of the things that do come right out you have to be, uh, you know, CG created because because you can't actually physically do it without without damaging the gear. And the other thing I love, too, is the fact that you, that you didn't do a lot of that, because my biggest problem with 3D movies in the past is that that's sort of the gimmick. It's like, well, it's 3D because, oh, oh I'm pointing at you. Yeah, I'm yeah. At no, we, didn't, we deliberately did not want to do that. We wanted to make a movie that was, had some really kind of classic, you know, kind of classical style of storytelling, and, 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 and yet use the 3D moments very judiciously. As opposed to as opposed to uh, everything's uh, Dr. Tongue's House of Pancakes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I read that you used the red camera as opposed to a film camera. We did. Yeah, yeah. Um, you 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 don't. We actually there is two film shots, uh, two or three film shots in the movie. They all have to do with uh, the slow mo fireballs. Uh, one at the beginning and one at the end. Those elements were actually shot at a, on a, in a dual film, 150 frame camera. At the time that we shot, the red cameras couldn't go that high frame rate wise. Uh, we can actually do any slow mo uh, when we're actually shooting the, the bulk of the film. So that's why those those are the only things shot in film. Everything else was shot in the uh, red cameras um, and the uh, silicon imaging uh, 2K uh, smaller stereo rig that we used for the steady cam stuff. Now, was Pittsburgh always the first choice to, uh, for the film? Uh, Pittsburgh is where we were sent. The studio had a deal there. That's where they wanted us to go, so that's where we okay. went. And, it, and within three days, it turned out to be the perfect location for the film. What's it, uh, what's it like shooting in a mine 200 feet underground? We started shooting in the mine in June when it was really hot and humid outside. Oh. And the mine oh. is constantly, oh, so like cool. constantly 55 degrees. I loved it. It was great. one of my favorite places to shoot. I think a lot of the crew would, might say otherwise, but it, yeah. was, uh, <laughs> was uh, it was uh, it was so cool and refreshing all the time. I love the fact that I had to put on a jacket on uh, to go in there. I find the the heat uh, and the humidity. I find it very hard to think. I, um, you know, our first day on stage, they didn't have the air, which we we went from the uh, from the uh, mine to four days, our final four days of photography on stage. We were shooting the car stuff, the interior car dialogue scene with uh, Jamie and Jensen, okay. and they didn't get the, any air conditioning for the stage. And inside that car, it must have been 110 degrees. And Jensen has this, you know, big jacket on. If you actually watch him, you can see him sweating throughout the take. It starts oh. running down his head because it is it is unbelievably sweltering inside that car. You know what's so funny is that I think that might you know that might have helped because oh yeah totally it totally it it, it works for the it works for the performance but yeah. I I it but was yeah it, I wouldn't want to be the one wearing that jacket you know he was he got very zen about it just kind of you know he he coped with it remarkably well but I could see he was just sweltering inside there oh my gosh. 
Now, you were able to get, and I'm sure this is the question you've probably been asked the most, you were able to get Tom Atkins to be in the film. Uh, what was it like working with him? Uh, Tom Atkins is amazing. He's uh, an incredibly uh, talented actor, a wonderful gentleman. Uh, you know, I absolutely love Tom. He, uh, I would work with him in anything or anywhere. We became instant friends uh, for the moment I sat down and had coffee with him to ask him if he'd do the film and, you know, hit it off like we'd known each other forever. And uh, he's just uh, an amazing talent and was so great to have him in the film and to, and to work with somebody like him. Uh, and more importantly, to work with him because uh, he's, uh, you know, Tom's a real treasure and it's, uh, it's great that we had him. As an experienced actor, not just, you know, as an actor, but also in this genre, does that help translate for you as a director with the other actors when he's on set? Well, absolutely. Both, uh, you know, we had uh, Tom and and, and uh, Kevin Ty, who uh, who are you know older actors who have got a ton of experience, um, who were who had a great rapport uh, with the younger cast, um, had a had uh, you know we had a really intuitive understanding of where the camera is, where this is, where you know where everything is. Had a, an immediate shorthand with uh, you know Jensen Kerr and Jamie and Eddie and. and uh, just it, those days when you had them all and said, you know, sometimes when you have, you know, five or six actors in the same scene, you're kind of like, ooh, this is going to be tough. But with those guys and, and the rest of the cast, it was always it was always wonderful to have, you know, this this incredibly diverse uh, group of talented people who were all so capable of their craft, who could change on a dime, who could add all sorts of different nuances, and uh, you know, that was it was a real treat. Now I think this might be the one question that most guys have. How were you able to convince Betsy Rue to do her part sans wardrobe? Betsy uh, kind of assumed that that's how the part was written. Um, we originally uh, thought she would be completely naked inside the the uh, motel room and then uh, might be clothed when she comes outside. But but when she came in and auditioned, that wasn't how she talked about it. So you know we went to the first we went to. Uh, Todd Farmer and I, we went and talked to our, our mutual spouses about it and saying, you know, what would you do? Would you go out, you know, would you dress or would you go out naked? Both of them said, you know, f that, we'd, you know, I wouldn't waste time putting clothes on. I'd go out there and, and, yep. and then we talked to the studio and said, what would you think if, if, you know, we want Betsy for the part. Um, what do you think if she did the whole thing naked? And the studio was like, oh, my God, do you think she'd do that? Um, they were so excited by the prospect and uh, then talked to Betsy about it and Betsy was amazing. She, she doesn't play it as you know some kind of sexual vamp, uh, as some kind of uh, uh, you know all kind of coy or whatever. She plays it uh, completely empowered. When she is out there you know, she, you know yeah. walking through that parking lot with a gun in her hand, it is not yeah, uh, it is not a moment of, of, of uh, of oh my God, there's a naked girl on screen. It's like oh my God, this woman's naked and completely empowered and completely yeah. going to kick ass. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know she she starts the sequence naked. And you're very aware of her nudity, and by the end of it, people have forgotten it because they're so entranced and hooked in uh, by her performance um, that you know people get locked into her terror. And that's a testament to Betsy as an actress that she's that she can can win. Uh, the audience over so completely and utterly, and have them have them be uh, completely on the journey with her uh, in this, you know, in the terror that she's experiencing, and 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 with in this, you know, fight for her life, and and to the point where they, you know, they like she seems to be totally unaware she's naked at that time because she's just trying to survive, and the audience is is really hooked in hooked into that same experience. It works so well, it really does. I mean, you guys did a great job with that. Uh, any plans for the DVD? Uh, yeah, there, uh, Todd Farmer and I have done a commentary for the DVD. There's a, a bunch of uh, deleted scenes, uh, an Easter egg or two. Um, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what else uh, the studio has planned yet. I know they're still putting it all together, so uh, uh, I haven't seen all of it uh, yet. Have they discussed whether or not they want to do just one version in the 3D, or do they want, or have they talked about maybe doing a 3D version on DVD and a 2D? Yeah, version? they have. Uh, they've talked about doing it, doing both, uh, both a 2D and a 3D version. You know, a 3D, a 3D. Well, I think it would be you'd actually have both in the same set, uh, is what they're discussing. Okay. Oh, great. That's yeah. great. Yeah, uh, you know, it comes with, you know, we come. I think it'd be anaglyph, so you know, it'd be the red and blue glasses, uh, which translates in the video oh. right now. 
right. and then hopefully when all the 3D TVs start coming out next year, they can uh, or become more commonplace, they'll, they'll you know re-release a, a polarized version. Great. Now, uh, as you mentioned earlier, you've been uh, editing for West Craven for the last 20 years now. Um, I know that this is a really general question, and it's hard to encapsulate 20 years worth of working experience. But um, moving from editor to director, what was it that you took with you from Wes, having having uh, having cut for him? Um, you know, one of the biggest things uh, I learned from Wes is that don't don't let. Uh, uh, style, uh, you know, cinematic style overshadow storytelling, um, overshadow performance, overshadow character. Those are more important than, than, oh my God, I have the camera, you know, flying down through, you know, through this tree, we're going through this mouse hole, out through this window, and out through the keyhole, and out through, you know, all these kind of like amazing shots don't ever make up for the power of a close-up uh, of an actor. Uh, so, you know, uh, other thing, that one of the main practical things he taught me is, you know, always have a plan, always know how you're going to get everybody home at night, <laughs> uh, which is once you start directing, you realize how unbelievably important that is to yeah. have that. Uh, so, you know, it was a lot of that kind of practical stuff, uh, as well as, you know, just some great uh, creative uh, sense. Well, it definitely translated onto the screen. And again, I just want to congratulate you on a fantastic film. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for joining me in the graveyard. Yeah, well, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Well, welcome back. See, I told you he would bring you right back here. I hope you enjoyed my interview with director Patrick Lussier. It was great having him on the show, and it was really informative learning about how he worked in that whole 3D process for the film. Well, that's going to do it for me here on this very first Tombstone edition of the Graveyard Show podcast. It was great having you here. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Please come back soon. There are going to be many more interviews being uploaded over the next few weeks and months to come. And as you exit the graveyard, I would like to remind you to please lock the gate behind you. We wouldn't want anyone to get out. Until next time.